as noted in the church newsletter, the scripture today is in Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. And now, verses 36 through 38. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along, who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Thank you, Charlie. We have a number of people that are not with us today, so we appreciate our visitors making up the difference. <clears throat> we're going to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer once again. Father in Heaven, we're thankful for our visitors that have come our way. We're thankful that Rod and Mary Legrand are with us, and Jim and Mona Carper, and Lincoln Rochelle Lukens and any others that are here. And we pray your blessings upon them as they spend their time here and enjoy uh, the coast. And we pray your blessings upon them in their travels, especially when they return home. Father, we're just so thankful that this is the Lord's Day. Uh, this one day during the week where we can all come together and to uh, sing praises to you and to pray with one another and, and commemorate the death of our Savior and to uh, be able to support the work through our contributions and to be able to hear your word proclaimed from this pulpit. And Father, we pray that you continue blessing this congregation and every good work that it seeks to accomplish. We pray for many opportunities to serve you, be unveiled to us, and we have eyes to see them, and that we would uh, take advantage of their, the many opportunities of, of letting our light uh, shine in the community, and not only here but throughout the world. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be with uh, those that are grieving, and we know, dear Lord, that the farmer family is lost um, they're a great patriarch in Bud, and we pray, dear Lord, the family may be able to be comforted with the hope that he's in a better place and that his pain is all gone. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, for all those victims in the Florida shooting, that those families may be comforted, and we pray that something can be done to prevent these school shootings and the the, the the insanity that's going on in this country. And, uh, and we pray, dear Lord, that something can be done with regard to the mental health of people and that intervention can be uh, manifested in uh, these people that have violent tendencies. And we pray, dear Lord, that uh, the nation would understand that the loss of you in their lives uh, leads to the deterioration of the mind and uh, will lead to such distorted ideas about violence. And we pray, dear Lord, that as God's people that we will uh, manifest the need in this country of returning back to you and to give you glory and serve you faithfully and to love our fellow man and to not seek vengeance or retaliation with regard to the, the people who wrong us. And dear Lord, we pray for the uh, military conflicts that are going on throughout this country, uh, pardon me, throughout this world. We pray, dear Lord, that you would intervene and bring this to an end and that all of our men and women who are in harm's way can be returned home. And we pray, dear, that, dear Lord, that uh, all the money saved from that would be used in an appropriate way for the betterment of this country. 
And Father, we pray that you would bless President Trump, that he can make those decisions that would uh, improve the quality of life in this world, and also to, to help direct this nation in a way that draws closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I saved something from the internet that I hope to be able to uh, read to you this morning. <clears throat> Let me see if I can find it. Days ago, Billy Graham passed away at 99 years of age. And I remember even when I was a little boy, I just loved to hear that man preach. And, uh, and he preached many years. And uh, I just read recently that he's going to be buried in a $200 pine box. And that is really an expression of his whole life. That he wasn't in it for the money. He was in it to give glory to God and to preach what he believed to be the gospel. While we may disagree in a few areas, I do not disagree with his deep conviction in the inspiration of the Bible and that the Bible is the authority for everything we do uh, with regard to our faith. Uh, this is a quotation from um, a renowned preacher in his own right. But I will not mention his name. It might take away from the impact of the statement about Billy Graham. If you went for a walk in the woods and then decided to wander off the path. This is a quotation of Billy Graham, I'm sorry. If you went to a, for a walk in the woods but then decided to wander off the path and found yourself surrounded by a thicket of thorns and poison ivy, who would you blame? Would you blame the person who built the path? No, of course not. Instead, you'd blame yourself if you were honest because you alone were responsible for wandering from the path. In a far deeper way, this is what happens when we decide to leave God out of our lives. For a time, it may seem like wandering away from him doesn't make any difference. It may even seem easier and freer, but eventually it catches up with us, just as wandering off that path into the thicket caught up with you. Billy Graham. I want to talk about John Mark a little bit. You say, well, who's John Mark? Well, he's Mark. But his full name was John Mark. Now, if he had a last name, I didn't know it. I don't know it. John Mark grew up in Jerusalem. And Acts chapter 12, we discover that his mother hosted a prayer session for the church. And uh, Peter had been arrested and he was in prison. They had already killed James, the Lord's, uh, uh, John's brother. And uh, Herod was thinking about doing the same thing with Peter. And the church had gathered in the home of John Mark's mother. Now that to me indicates that she probably was a widow. And um, that's the first mention of Mark. And as we fast forward into the next chapter, we discover that uh, Barnabas and Paul were selected by the church of Antioch, not too far from modern-day Damascus, to be the first major missionaries of the early church. And Barnabas' cousin, Mark, was there, and he said, let's take Mark along. Well, obviously, when you put a missionary team, not everybody has the same job. And here, this young man was very vital to their work, Obviously, they would probably have to sleep outdoors, and they'd have to make arrangements, and they would have to have the cooking done. And so it's just the three of them, and obviously, we find Barnabas and Paul preaching the gospel, and Mark was assisting them. Mark had an important role to fill. And certainly, because of his presence, it made it 
possible for Paul and Barnabas to do more preaching. Otherwise, they would probably have to spend more time preparing food, the campsites, places to go and places to preach, and it would be more time consuming, and the arrangements for all that would probably consume much of their preaching time. And so they went to the Isle of Crete, and there they had a great success. Now, I don't know if they had already set out an itinerary for their mission work, but it appears as if Paul says, let's just go north across the uh, Mediterranean here uh, and, and enter into Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. And it was once they arrived there, we discover that Mark decided that that was not for him. And it says, as read by Charlie a moment ago in chapter 13, verse 13, John left them, that's John Mark, and returned to Jerusalem. Well, that didn't set too well with the Apostle Paul. And I am sure that without his presence, the work suffered, and they had to pick up the slack, whatever that was, that was provided by John Mark. So later in chapter 15, we discover that Paul and Barnabas were together and they figured that it was time to return and visit those new congregations and see those new Christians and see how they were faring since the time that they uh, converted them and established the churches in those areas. Well, Barnabas was desirous to take John Mark with him. And Paul insisted that they not take Mark with him. And Luke used this expression that declares even Luke's estimation of the situation, who deserted them in Pamphylia and had, gone, had not gone with them to the work. And so there was a difference of opinion between Barnabas and Paul, and so Paul took Silas, another disciple, and went and visited those churches, and Barnabas took Mark and went back to Crete and visited the churches there. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Mark that I think is often overlooked. He had one of the greatest, greatest advantages and privileges extended to man. He was selected to become a part of the team of the greatest apostle and missionary and evangelist the world has ever known. The Apostle Paul's assistant. You think about all the thousands in Jerusalem. In Acts 2.41 it says, And 3,000 souls were baptized. And then chapter uh, four, it says that the number came to 5,000 Christians in Jerusalem. And then the number was so great, they stopped uh, counting. And of all those souls and all those disciples, Mark was chosen to assist in the first grand missionary journey. Think of the company that he was with. Think of the work that he was given. Think of the satisfaction and joy that he would have to see the great success of the preaching of the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. And so what about us? Among the billions on this planet, only a small percent are Christians, and the rest are lost. Why me, Lord? Among all these billions, why am I so fortunate to be born in America? Why not India, Iran, Russia, China, Bosnia, or somewhere else? I'm an, I am greatly favored, and so are you, to be able to say I'm, Amer I'm an American. We are blessed so, so well that if you're going to be poor, you want to be a poor American, not poor somewhere else, right? 
And I tell you, when you think about it and how favored we are, like Mark, how grateful and thankful are we to the Lord that we're in the situation we're in rather than in a situation that many Christians in the Islamic countries that are, that are serving the Lord behind closed doors and secretly because their life is on the line. In Esther chapter 4, 4 uh, 13 and 14, Mordecai said to his cousin, some say niece, with regard to Esther's position as queen, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews that Haman had uh, arranged um, a cleansing of the Jews and she was a Jew as well. Verse 14, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Mordecai spoke the truth that God placed her in a position where she could save her people. This lowly little Jewish girl became the queen of the Medo-Persians. Given such a time as this, a position that is incomparable. You know, we as Christians make up God's family. And what a company of believers are we with? And it's a privilege, not a right. We're not born by birth into the family of God. We are reborn into the kingdom and the family of God. We are called in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, the bride of Christ. And so, in 3 John 4, we have joy incomparable because of our relationship to the Lord, to God. And because we're so favored then, there are greater responsibilities. And so Mark's responsibility came from the fact that he responded to the choice of him over others. In Acts 13 and verse 5, he was called their helper. He was chosen for a purpose, a reason, and he had a task that had to be done. None others had the same task. He was important. He had an important role. His work make it, made it easier and quicker and safer and more successful for the others. And as we said earlier, Mark would free up the hands of Paul and Barnabas to preach the gospel. Now, their plans partly based upon his responsibility to his commitment. Now, they assumed that they could do more because Mark was with them. And each Christian is responsible for his or her calling. And we are to make our calling and election sure, 2 Peter 1 and verse 10. It was the late uh, renowned gospel preacher Guy Ann Woods who made the first observation I have ever seen, and I have based my uh, uh, many lessons upon this observation, that if you would read all the parables in Matthew 25 of the judgment, those people that were judged, and you think about the man of the talent uh, or uh, the, the virgins that didn't trim their uh, lamps with oil, um, all these were condemned, not for something that they did that was wrong, but for the things they failed to do that was right. And so when we talk about the sin of omission, James 4 and verse 17, we're talking about something that is as condemning as something that we do that is wrong. If somebody says, well, you know, I don't do this and I don't do that. I'm a good person. And the question is, well, do you do this or do you do that? Oh, no, I don't do that. Well, God says you're going to go to hell because Christianity is more than negative. Christianity is more than not doing. Christianity is about doing, serving. Mark had a responsibility. He couldn't preach like the Apostle Paul. He couldn't probably uh, comfort and exhort like Barnabas. But he could do something. He could make it easier for them to do what they needed to do. 
You know, the question often been asked, why did Mark abandon the work? And some of the questions, uh, some of the answers to that question are probably not as um, probable as others. One was, I read, that he was angry at Paul and very jealous for his uh, cousin Barnabas because before this, it was always Barnabas and Saul. And at this time, the record began to read Saul and Barnabas. So it appears like Jesus and John the Baptist that at the beginning, Barnabas was the leader. He introduced Saul to the church and to the leaders. And now the roles seem to be switching and Paul, becoming Saul, uh, who was Saul, became the leader. And maybe, maybe Mark was upset with Paul because of that. Maybe he was saying, it's unfair to Barnabas for you to assume the role of leader when Barnabas was in the church long before you. I don't know, but that could have been. And I only mention that because there are many people, Christians, who uh, won't become involved because their job was replaced. Maybe they didn't do their job as well as somebody else, and somebody else, else took over that job, and they are upset because they no longer had that job or role, and so they quit the church. But what's our attitude? It should be Psalm 84.10. I would rather, says David, be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. We all have our role, and we should discover what that is. In 1 Corinthians 12, 21, does the head say to the feet, I have no need of you? We all have a role to fill in the church. But some people, unless they have this very present role, maybe they won't do anything. But have you ever heard this expression, if you're too big for a little job, you're too little for a big job? And that's very important, that there is no really little jobs. Was he fearful? I think scholars indicate the extreme dangers of that region in Asia Minor. And perhaps Mark didn't count the cost, Luke 14, 28, says Jesus. Maybe he wasn't present. No, actually, I know he wasn't present. Because in Acts 14, 22, he told the early church, Paul says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And so, did he fear persecution, rejection? But in Luke 9, 62, he who puts his hand to the plow and turns back is unfit for the kingdom of God. And so, did he minimize the importance of his place? Let me show you the importance of one individual. And I took this from my mentor's track, Royal Priesthood, by Avon Malone. He gathered this information, not me. One vote saved Andrew Johnson from impeachment. One vote brought the French monarchy to an end. One vote decided the Rutherford Hayes Samuel Tilden presidential election. The states of Texas and California were admitted to the Union by a single solitary vote. Time and again, history heralds the importance of one. One vote, one daring decisive deed, one individual. Each time the individual whose act was so significant may have wondered, does my action really matter? After all, I'm only one of many. You see, Mark may have thought, I'm just a lowly servant. Actually, the Greek word was used of a low ro a rower that's in, in a boat, usually uh, manned by slaves. And so this helper uh, mentality was, my role's not that important, so they won't miss me. Well, Luke says that he abandoned or forsook the team. And that was not acceptable to the Lord. <clears throat> There's a story that I want to share with you. In 1947, 22 planes from North Island Naval Air Station were aloft 
at dusk participating in naval day maneuvers when a blanket of fog swept in unexpectedly. Uh, stranding the planes in midair for hours and wiping out all the landmarks, eight planes raced immediately to, uh, to landing fields, four crashed, and by 8 p.m., two planes were still aloft. Naval officials estimated they had about 20 minutes of fuel left. Suddenly, someone had a brilliant idea, and a message went over the radio pleading for everyone who was near the abandoned camp uh, site outside of San Diego to drive there to provide the light necessary for the pilots to land safely. Soon the roads approached the field, uh, approaching the fields were crowded with cars creeping along with their feeble headlights. As the cars arrived, they were lined up around the field with the, face, uh, the cars facing inward. The lights of no single car made much of an impression upon the night or the fog, but the lights of 2,500 of them transformed it with their headlights into a blazing field of light so brilliantly that the two pilots were brought down to safely. safety. You see, we need to start realizing how important each of us is to the Lord. And through a joint effort, more can be accomplished than the work of any solitary individual. It has been proved that the joint effort of horses pulling a load are greatly increased if you would add the efforts of each one individually. For some reason, you put them together, they pull more than you add up what they can do individually. Does that make sense? So the accumulated effect of efforts joined together is greater. So when each one of us contribute to the work of the Lord, together we'll accomplish more than if we would do it singly. Another thing, did he assume a responsibility that he was unqualified for? Sometimes we're discouraged because we're given a position that maybe uh, we weren't qualified to do. And maybe it's embarrassing that we, we give up on something because we feel inadequate for the task. And so instead of asking maybe, can I do something else, they're discouraged and ashamed and maybe they quit the church or become discouraged because of their sense of failure. Maybe Mark felt that he wasn't adequately prepared. But you know, sometimes other people can see our potential and abilities better than we can. Sometimes we're so hard upon ourselves that if we're asked to do something and we feel like we didn't do an adequate job, we can be so discouraged. But you know, we all must uh, crawl before we walk. When we ask the men to lead prayer up here in the first time, they may have to read the prayer. That's not, a that's not a defeat. That's a victory. And over time, they'll be able to say their prayers without reading their prayers. And their prayers will be as beautiful as anybody else's. We have to crawl before we walk. But you know, if Mark thought that his, his, he was not up to the task, Barnabas and Paul believed that he was, or he would not have been selected for the role that he was given. So sometimes we need to listen to other people's estimation of our abilities and be motivated by their trust in our ability to accomplish those things rather than just uh, feel discouraged because of our low self-esteem with regard to those things. Another thing. He did not think of the consequences for the team, nor did he think about the consequences he would suffer. He only thought about his own comfort and as a result, he didn't think about the consequences of placing a burden upon others. 
You know, we have a hard time getting volunteers to take the Lord's Supper to a lonely, elderly sister in Christ. And when only a few people do this, do we even think about the possibility that a, of, of the difficulties that it creates for those that only do it? Same way with cleaning the church building. The same thing applies to teaching Bible class. When we slough off, as the word, as the expression goes, somebody else has to pick up the load. Right? Let's not be a John Mark and abandon the work. Not only did he miss out on the remainder of the trip, he missed out on sharing in the success of the church. When they came back, they reported their success to the church, to the elders in Antioch. Where was Mark? He wasn't there during the celebrations. He was back home in Jerusalem with his mom. And so he missed out on the second trip with Paul also. You see, sin has consequences. It jeopardize our, jeopardizes our opportunities to serve. And so Mark helps us to be more aware of our responsibility to the church. Like Mark, we must desire to work along faithful Christians. He had good motives and good intentions. In 2 Corinthians 6, 1, we are workers together with him. It's amazing how often we read in scripture the word fellow and is connected with such words as fellow servant, fellow workers, fellow citizens in the kingdom, fellow soldiers. You know what the fellow means there. It means to, to be together with others. And we're not servants alone. We're not workers alone. We're not citizens in the kingdom alone. We're not soldiers alone. We are fellow members of the work. And unlike Mark, we must remain faithful at our post of duty. A soldier, in 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4, must be loyal and take orders and be a team player. A soldier must be willing to die honorably for his country. A soldier will be faithful even unto death. And so we must be faithful in our service to God. And so I always come back to this question. Are we more faithful today than we were yesterday? And that's a soul-searching question. Will we be more faithful tomorrow than we are today? Will we, like Mark, abandon the work, forsake the work, and turn it over to somebody else and burden them with heavier responsibilities? And so you can see that this applies in a lot of areas. The beautiful work of taking food to needy families. If it falls only just a few, then it burdens them although they don't call it a burden. But I wonder if the Lord sees it fairly. That some won't do what others do a lot of in serving. I hope this lesson about Mark sinks in deep because it's a lesson that this church needs desperately. You know, Mark should have never allowed anything to take precedence over his commitment to the Lord and to the church. But he did. Something caused him to forsake the work. Something became more important to him than his first commitment. Don't let that happen to you. I don't want it to happen to me. We must not entangle ourselves in the affairs of everyday life, says Paul, of the Christian soldier. In a recent article in the Gospel Advocate publication, the article was titled, The Scourge of Overcommitment. That results in the neglect of important work. A friend of mine in the past lost his wife, lost, and I'm not talking about in death, 
he lost his wife to internet relationships and all three of his girls went down the wrong path. He worked three jobs. He said he always had to work those three jobs. He was never home. He was a workaholic. And I asked him, why do you re re uh, work at three jobs? He said, I have to take care of my family. Well, do you know that his father-in-law let him live in their place here on the coast without paying any rent? And yet he still had to work three jobs, and he made a lot of money. But he lost his wife. He lost his children. Why? The scourge of overcommitment. We can be too busy in the affairs of life that we forget the role of servant in the church. We cannot have people who overcommit themselves in the world and, and think that we're going to have a growing church. You know, like Mark, however, once we realize our place in the kingdom and the importance of our service, we can start over. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we have the beautiful statement to Timothy. Bring Mark with you because he's very important for my ministry. Mark made good. He turned his life around. And guess what? One of the four Gospels was written by Mark. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark, that man who abandoned the work, turned his life around. And it's said that he was the right-hand man of the Apostle Peter. And much of what he wrote with regard to the Lord came from the Apostle Peter. And he finally had a relationship restored with Paul to a point that Paul says, he's very important now for my ministry. So he turned his life around. He recommitted himself. And in the old sense, he lived down that past. He made a mistake. He paid for it. But at least he had the sense to reflect about what happened. And he put that aside and he allowed that to be a catapult of greater service rather than a source of discouragement and loss. So what an inspiration. Can you place yourself with Mark? I can. Many times. Mark is an encouragement. He's not a discouragement. And throughout scripture, we find that our God is a God of second chances. And we have a second chance right now. And if you need to respond to the gospel call, it's your opportunity, extended by God, to start again afresh. Please come as we stand and sing.